All right, so welcome. We are at the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, so to those who have been here before and those that are just joining for the first time, welcome, pleasure to have you here. Um, we uh, are a community run organization. Uh, and as I've been saying throughout this series, it's wonderful to actually be teaching in an embodiment of uh, alternative way of being in this world. Um, last week and tonight, we're really focusing on capitalism and compassion. And uh, I just really love that the Dharma Center and many other Dharma centers, um, but this one in particular, really strives to kind of um, not see these teachings and these practices as a commodity. Um, I love the idea of kind of them um, as being like this immeasurable priceless offering. And so our teachings of Dharma and also the secular classes, which tonight is, um, can, can happen almost free of charge. You know, it's a gift to the community. Uh, and then uh, any dana or donation that you would like to give in return is totally optional. But how amazing is that, that we live in this kind of transactional capitalist world, and yet now we have this center that kind of embodies in an, an alternative way of being. So welcome to the Dharma Collective. Um, for those of you that I haven't met, my name is Tig. Uh, I'm a meditation teacher. I did my training um, in medical and research institutions. So I teach at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I also teach for a research study at Brown University and uh, at Pratt Institute, which I was actually just sharing. Today was the last day of the semester. Uh, so it's kind of sad, but also beautiful to see a lot of the students that I uh, teach there are graduating this year. And so uh, a lot of things that we're talking about tonight, we've been talking about all semester. So it's wonderful to know that there's 40 or 50 of these kind of seeds going out into the world to, to flourish. Um, so this series of classes is called Embodied Ethics. Um, so for those of you that are just joining, this really has arisen out of my observation that a lot of the suffering in the world is caused by this kind of lack of a safety net of ethics. Um, so for the past couple of months, I had been teaching kind of this uh, secular mindfulness woven together with Buddha Dharma, kind of how they inform each other, which then evolved into this, uh, these teachings on secular ethics. And uh, the reason that we call it embodied is um, there's lots of conversations about ethics and they're usually very intellectual. They're very cognitive, very heady. Um, and that's good. And we need to have those, but we also need to feel, we have to embody um, what these ethics mean. And it's different for all of us. Um, but we can't just think about ethics. We can't just think about ethical ways of being. We actually have to practice and move about the world in, in a way that we're embodying them. Um, so uh, throughout this series, we've been kind of using the framework of ethics as a, a guideline or um, principles, moral principles um, that are beneficial to self and other, um, kind of leading to a constructive result for not just the individual, but society and the planet. Um, I already used the word once, but just naming that this is a secular class. So it doesn't require, you don't have to be a Buddhist. Um, you don't have to have any particular worldview, religious or otherwise. It is a universal teaching. Um, and there's no kind of supernatural powers involved. So really uh, focusing on this kind of universally accessible way into these ethics. Um, so I wanted to kind of create some space to feel into these ethics, um, but also to share some of my journey in exploring ethical ways of being, and then also create space for all of us to share and ask questions and discuss and, and talk about them. Um, I also want to mention, some of you know this already, that a big inspiration for this, um, for this series of classes is my father who was a special agent in the FBI and a lawyer, dedicated his life to ethical living. Uh, and today actually is the two month anniversary of his passing. So I wanted to 
offer this, thank you, offer this as my own way of continuing his work in the world. Um, so um, thank you for joining. Uh, I want to actually start our time tonight with a poem. Uh, those of you that have come for our queer sangha, um, will, this will sound familiar. Um, but the poem is called An Invitation to a Brave Space. And this is from a uh, Black American feminist um, named Mickey Scott Bay Jones. Um, so as you listen to these words, you might want to close the eyes or just pour all of your attention into the sentiments as you hear them. Together, we'll create brave space because there's no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and we all have caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. One of the things that this poem speaks to is there's no such thing as a safe space. And I think it's really genius that she kind of transformed that idea into this brave space. And talking about ethics, especially capitalism uh, and kind of the compatibility or incompatibility of compassion with capitalism, it does take bravery and courage to kind of turn and look at this because we're all participating in it. Uh, and so I just really like some of these sentiments here about we have the right to start somewhere and grow, like start where we are um, and that it won't be perfect. Uh, I think that that is a key in so many different things. But for this course, like I'm not sitting up here saying that I'm doing it perfectly and I know exactly the right ways to do this. I'm not an economist. I don't know the ins and outs of how to run an economy. Uh, but I do know that there is something that's not working. There's something destructive in the way that our world is working right now. Um, so I just really enjoy the sentiments of her words, um, kind of gives us permission to show up as we are, to explore and support each other as we kind of create this space to, to do this work together. Um, so if you're just joining this series of classes, this is our fifth class. Um, so no worries if this is your first time uh, joining the series. Um, we have been kind of exploring the pillars of secular ethics in the first couple classes. So the first one being interdependence or interconnection, um, that we don't operate, we don't live, work, play uh, in silos, that we are all interconnected. Um, and in the absence of a religious worldview, um, these pillars are something that we can all agree on. Uh, so this interdependence is something that most of these teachings of, or all of these teachings of ethics can fall back on. Uh, the reason why we need to move ethically and not cause destruction or seek to mitigate how much harm we're causing in the world <clears throat> is because we are all connected. Uh, a lot of different religions consider that to be the golden rule, you know, do unto others as you would do for yourself or you would like to have done for yourself. And that is really based on this idea of uh, interdependence. I like to um, kind of consider or think about, you know, how if one person is suffering, all people are suffering. You know, we can't see, we can't be in a world where we just turn away from other people's suffering. Um, it doesn't mean that we have to be the savior and then we have to have the answers, but we do it needs, needs to turn and look because where there's suffering of others, I, I keep looking out the window because it's just, there's so much uh, that um, if we're truly connected and if we're really moving through the world with embodied awareness, then we would be suffering as well. 
So that's the first pillar. And then the second pillar is this shared humanity. So we all seek to feel good. We want to avoid pain. And this is something that's common among all life forms, not just humans, but also animals and plants. Um, so we have this shared experience of wanting to feel good and not wanting to feel bad. And so these two pillars of interdependence and our shared humanity are um, the foundations of this uh, ethical way of being. The first ethic that we explored in the third class was do no harm or ahimsa. Um, and we kind of explored that with the idea of forgiveness. So where we might be causing harm, asking for forgiveness, where harm was done to us, offering forgiveness. It's a big topic. Um, all of these classes are recorded on YouTube. So if you are just joining and you would like to go back and uh, experience some of those, you're most welcome to. Classes one and two were the pillars. Class three was do no harm. And then class four, we started our exploration in compassion. Uh, we had a longer practice and discussion around compassion in general, and then just started talking about capitalism towards the end of the class. So um, decided to make tonight a continuation, kind of a part two. Um, so no worries if you weren't here last week either, we'll, we'll catch up um, with some practice. And one of the big things from last week is that we didn't really get a chance to talk, you know, to like really share and, and hear what each other's impressions of this kind of um, one of the relationship between compassion and, and capitalism. So I want to leave a really good chunk of time for discussion and sharing uh, tonight. Um, so we'll settle in for a little meditation. Um, you already heard me use the word embodied awareness. I think that's kind of the cornerstone before we can embody ethics. We have to embody awareness. Uh, others might call that mindfulness. Uh, so we'll be practicing um, paying attention to our experience. We'll be in the body for a little while. We'll explore being with sounds and thoughts as well. Um, and then we'll end the practice with um, some time to reflect on difficulty, where things in our life might be hard. Um, and then towards the end of the practice, I'm actually going to invite us to open our eyes and share as part of the meditation. So um, we'll check it out with an open mind. Okay. So let's settle in for a little practice. This will just be um, maybe about... 16 or 17 minutes. So finding a way of being that feels comfortable for that amount of time. Uh, if you're in the space, there's blankets and cushions over here. You're welcome to sit, uh, lay down. <clears throat> uh, at home, finding comfortable posture that feels supportive. You can turn your camera off if that feels comfortable. I'm just taking your time to invite stillness into the body as you're ready. And making that transition from the outer world to the inner world. Perhaps for you, that means closing the eyes or just softening the gaze and lowering your view down to a surface in front of you. And just take a moment to let your awareness drop down into the body. And just simply notice, what is it like to be embodied in this form right now? And notice if there's some narration, if there's some cognition that's analyzing what it's like to be in the body maybe even judgments or analysis. And here the invitation is really just to feel. So answering this question, not with words, but feeling. What is it like in the body right now? And then simply listening. Listening to the sensations.
listening to the energy that might be in the body. And as we drop our awareness down into the somatic field, it's oftentimes when we notice how busy the mind may be. So just pausing for a moment to notice the quality of the attention. Perhaps lingering energy in the, in the mind from earlier conversations or activities during the day. Whatever's happening in the mind is welcome to be here. There's no way that your mind should or should not be in this moment. And then returning once again to the aliveness of the body. Perhaps you're noticing sensations of contact, the chair, the floor, a cushion. Just taking a moment to feel that support rising up to meet and hold the body. Noticing any areas of obvious tension. Seeing what happens when you bring your awareness to areas of the body where you might be holding or squeezing, bracing. And let's invite a sense of ease into the somatic field, softening the muscles of the face, relaxing the jaw, softening the shoulders, all the way down into the abdomen, the pelvic floor, seeing if it's possible to relax and release. Noticing if there's a particular way that you might be holding your arms and legs that are creating tension and see if it's possible to just let go. Relax into the support beneath you. In any areas where there might be unpleasant sensations or still holding on to some tension or stress, perhaps considering just allowing it to be there exactly as it is and not pushing or struggling against any discomfort that same sense of softening and letting go that we've been practicing in the body, we can also do in the mind around areas where there might be unpleasant sensations. And so we'll spend a little bit more time here just feeling into the body. Perhaps for you, you like to scan through part by part, or maybe just resting in an open awareness of the sensations in the body. And however you're choosing to practice in this moment, know that being aware of the feeling tones of the present moment as experienced in the body is also a practice of embodiment of our ethical way of being, the ability to feel, to sense what's arising in the somatic field is an anchor for our practice and ethics.
you're noticing any time the mind moves away from the body, either into thoughts or sounds, know that that's perfectly fine. It's part of the practice. And returning from a wandering mind is what strengthens the pathways of awareness and embodiment. So there's no need to force your attention into the body or strive to keep it focused on a particular sensation. Just bringing that sense of ease and relaxation into the way that you're paying attention to the body gentle and relaxed, curious and open. And this part of the practice is called interoception, feeling the body from the inside. And welcoming whatever it is that we're finding in our experience, no particular way that it should or should not be. And cultivating a, a sense of vividness to the way that you're paying attention to the sensations or even lack of sensation in particular parts of the body. And in a moment, we're going to make a transition. So gathering up all of the attention from the body and shifting from the sense of feeling to the sense of sound. Perhaps you'd like to bring your awareness to the eardrums. And let your attention rest here in the inner ear and allow the waves of sound to come to you. Experiencing the present moment through the sounds in your environment those that are steady and consistent, and those sounds that arise and disappear more quickly on top. And noticing if you're thinking about the sounds, Labeling the sounds, judging the sounds, and as much as possible, suspending all of those mental formations and simply leaning back in the mind and listening. And this practice of listening also is a training for an ethical way of being, deep listening. 
when others are speaking, the ability to listen, to understand, listen, to empathize, listen, to feel compassion. So seeing the next few moments of practicing with sound as a practice and deep listening. Noticing when the mind moves away from the sounds and starts focusing on thoughts or perhaps returns to sensations in the body. And again, that's never a problem in this practice. In fact, it increases our ability to be present with what's happening. So whenever we notice that the mind is no longer with sound, we're already back in the present moment. And here we have choice to return back to this moment, the sound. And let's make another transition now. We'll stay with listening, but this time shifting from listening to the external environment now to listening to our thoughts. So turning the awareness to the domain of the mind. Mind like a blue sky and thoughts like clouds floating by. Practicing being the observer of the mental formations, whether they're words or images. As much as possible, not thinking the thought, not cognitively fusing with the thought. Rather, just being the observer, creating some space between the observing mind and the thinking mind. There may be times where you notice that you're thinking a thought, following a thought into the next thought. And whenever that happens, again, it's not a problem. It's very normal for the mind to run away like that. So whenever you notice that might be where your mind is right now, again, you've created the opportunity for choice to return back to the spaciousness of the domain of the mind and simply leaning back and watching the mental formations as they arise, abide, and then disappear.
And just like we've been practicing with interoception and deep listening, turning our awareness to our thoughts is also a practice for an ethical way of being. We have thousands and thousands of thoughts, paying attention to the mental formations offers us space to choose the thoughts that are constructive and beneficial and let those that might not be to just move along, not pushing anything away, not avoiding anything, just simply resting in an open awareness of the mind. If this becomes confusing or overwhelming at any point, you're welcome to come to the breath or the feeling of the body and the chair or the cushion just to stabilize the awareness. And then as you're ready, returning back to the domain of the mind. And remembering there's no right or wrong in this practice, just simply being with your experience. If the mind is busy, the mind is busy. If the mind is quiet and calm, the mind is simply quiet and calm. And now let's release the object of our awareness. Making a transition now to call to mind an aspect of life that's happening either right now or in the recent past that's difficult. Perhaps a challenge in your work life, maybe a difficult relationship perhaps distressing news that you've read recently about something happening in the world that's difficult. And starting to focus in on one aspect of difficulty in your life. And just notice what's arising in the body as you rest your awareness in this difficulty. Perhaps there's a texture or a shape or a color that's associated with this sensation. Notice if there's a sense of movement or temperature into this sensation. And perhaps considering that there are other beings out there in the world that are feeling something similar to what you're experiencing right now, maybe for different reasons different causes and conditions, but that you're not alone in feeling whatever it is that you're feeling. You're not wrong or broken. 
is simply a response to some sort of stress or suffering that you're encountering. And so we can take a moment here to offer ourselves some self-compassion. The aspiration to alleviate suffering. May I be free. May I be at ease as I experience this difficulty. May I have the bravery to turn and face this difficulty head on. Perhaps you'd like to take a few deep breaths, imagining you could direct the air into this area of the body. And not to get rid of the sensation, but simply to nurture. For those of you that like to visualize, perhaps imagining wrapping this area of the body in a warm, glowing, nurturing energy. And notice if there's been any shift or change to this sensation. No expectation, just curiosity. And in a moment, we're going to make another shift. Staying in the practice. If it feels comfortable, if their eyes are closed, perhaps considering returning to open eyes as you stay in your meditation. And if your eyes are open, consider looking around the room, looking around your Zoom screen, and know that all of us humans here are experiencing some sort of stress or suffering in this moment. And whether your eyes are open or closed, broadening the awareness to being in this community of other humans that are experiencing something difficult. And what is that like? What arises for you in the mind and the body and the heart? As you call to mind that there are other beings in closer proximity to you that are suffering. you're welcome to leave the eyes open or returning back to close the eyes. And knowing that we have cultivated in our circle a sense of ways that we struggle, things that are difficult. And so just like we are offering ourselves some self-compassion, let's extend that same aspiration to alleviate suffering to each other. May we all be free. May we all be at ease as we navigate this challenge. May we all be brave as we turn and face this difficulty. If there's any other phrases that you'd like to offer the group silently in your mind, you can do so now.
perhaps imagining a, a glowing warm energy from the heart center radiating out to this entire community here that's gathered to practice to learn feeling that sense of interconnection and our shared humanity Before we come to an end of this practice, let's take a moment to let go of any thought forms or visualization and begin ending just as we began by noticing what's here now. As we come to an end of this practice, perhaps you'd like to invite some movement back into the body, maybe wiggling fingers and toes, perhaps coming into some gentle stretches or other movement that would feel supportive, returning back to open eyes if they were closed. So this practice had many points. We were kind of exploring our sensory experience as a a training ground for some of these ethical ways of being, feeling, listening, thinking. And then we shifted into calling to mind things that are difficult, something that might be difficult right now. Sorry, there's a drip and I'm gonna unplug those for safety. Okay, thank you. So I have a question for those that are up to share. What was it like in the moment where you called to mind that other people in the room were suffering or experiencing difficulty? What was that like for you in that moment? If you're in the room, an invitation to use the microphone so our friends uh, on Zoom can hear. And if you're online, you're welcome to unmute yourself and speak. You're also welcome to add any reflections into the chat. And Tia will help uh, facilitate that. So what was that like in that moment that you kind of called to mind that other people that are nearby you are are experiencing difficulty? What came up? Um, yeah, it was, it was a pretty brief kind of, um, realization. It was just like, that was just suddenly like less lonely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Mm. Less lonely. Thanks for sharing that. Actually, what you say kind of brings up that for me too i think during the meditation i was having some sort of insight around feeling kind of lonely right now even though i I kind of didn't realize that was a feeling that was going on and like you said there was that kind of a little bit of a release of that loneliness through that process so yeah i can relate to that thank you and angela put in the chat um that uh uh, a strong sense of connection. I felt a strong sense of connection. Mm-hmm. And Perry just put in the chat, feeling the same boat that we're all in. Mm, yeah. So this is our shared humanity. This is kind of the root of compassion. Um, so thank you for sharing that, you know, a little less lonely and feeling that connection, that awareness that there, um, is this kind of common element of our humanity. 
Um, so there's lots of different ways to practice compassion. You know, in that practice, we had some phrases, we had some visualization, both for ourselves and others. Um, and compassion really being this kind of um, aspiration or even action um, to alleviate suffering. Uh, in the traditional lineages, compassion is this wish to be free from suffering. Uh, and so that's kind of the functional definition that we're going to stay with for tonight as we focus on compassion. I want to make sure that we leave plenty of time for discussion. So I am going to just read some reflections that I actually wrote down after our class last week, just to kind of stir the pot a little bit. And then we can spend the rest of our time talking about it. So as I mentioned, compassion fundamentally about caring for the well-being of others and reducing suffering. Capitalism, on the other hand, is based on a system of competition and individualism. So we already heard in that practice, that feeling of connection and community, not so much as an individual, yet capitalism thrives on us being separate and individual. Profit is prioritized over people and the planet. This system often leads to exploitation of vulnerable people and resources rather than caring for them. As I mentioned last week, the system also creates wealth inequity, exploitation of natural resources, consumerism and waste, inequitable access to healthcare, emphasis on competition over cooperation, the influence of money on politics, and lack and scarcity mindset. So from my point of view, this is not compatible with the aspiration to reduce suffering. And therefore, compassion and capitalism are not compatible. Capitalism has its roots in colonialism, imperialism, and slavery, and continues to perpetuate systems of oppression incompatible with these aspirations of compassion. The legacy of this country, the violence it has created and created a capacity for, this is not compassion. This country was built on the backs of black slaves after the genocide of the indigenous people. We're continuing to propagate this when we participate in capitalism. This too is not embodiment of compassion. When we prioritize profit over people, we contribute to social and economic inequality and we perpetuate suffering. A compassionate society would prioritize the well being of all its members not just those who are able to compete and win in the capitalist system. Therefore, we must explore alternative economic systems that prioritize human well-being and environmental sustainability and work towards creating a more just and equitable society that is grounded in compassion and ethical ways of being. We talk a lot about well-being. In spiritual circles, it's often about our own well-being. But how can one be well if so many others are suffering? How can we talk about well-being then turn around and participate in the very systems of oppression that are causing so much suffering and damage? For me, I knew if I was going to teach and practice compassion that I needed to walk the walk. I couldn't be one of those that just talks about this and then turns around and goes out into the world and participates in it in that way. So I've had to look at how I participate, knowing that these are the waters that we swim in. I had to stop consuming. I had to do my research before I buy things. I had to look at what my carbon footprint is and have an honest conversation with myself about the damage that I was causing to the environment. I personally chose to let go and renounce my personal belongings. And I have been living for the past eight years nomadically. I feel that part of my role as a teacher planting these seeds of, of change uh, is part of moving through this difficult world with a sense of compassion. The dana donation teaching that we embody here, um, the places where I teach in the hospitals and universities, the participants are not paying for it. The organizations are, but the individuals are not. In my, so I'm an artist, for those of you that uh, we're just meeting tonight, that I try, my art is done on beaches, so there's no carbon footprint. I'm simply working with sand. And as I move into launching my art business, I'm looking very carefully at the 
materials that things will be printed on, the inks, the shipping costs, and then offsetting the carbon emissions and the pricing model of my art. And most of all, I'm practicing compassion. In the morning with my eyes closed, may all beings be free from suffering. So this is how I do it. I'm not saying that this is how you do it. Um, and this is why I want to leave room for conversation. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I have a carbon footprint. I participate in capitalism. Um, it will look different for all of us. And it should look different. Our children, the younger generations, need models of other ways of doing this, whether it's gifting, resource-based sharing, or simply naming that there's something wrong and not turning a blind eye to the suffering that's all around us. If we turn our, our heads away and don't practice, nothing will change. So we have about 40 minutes left of our time together. And I know that, that was some heaviness in there, what I was sharing. But as we practice and in that, that those moments of compassion and feeling that there are other people around us that are suffering, let's expand that to this entire economy, that there are many that are being oppressed and held down by the ways that we are actively participating in it. So I want to just open it up and, and have some dialogue um, and, and hear what's on your hearts, what's on your mind, what's coming up as you hear some of these words and, and how this concept and practice of compassion sits with our economy. Before we do that, I just want to put some ground rules for sharing uh, that um, we're, we're listening to each other respecting each other. We all have different points of view. Your points may be different from mine, but our strength comes from our diversity. So really respecting that. And then also just an awareness of how much space we're taking up as we are sharing. So if we are sharing a lot, perhaps consider stepping back. And if we've been quiet at times, perhaps stepping forward. So really making sure that we have enough space for everyone to share here. So with that, I wanna open it up for some, some discussion. What's coming up? What's on your mind? How are you responding to what you heard around this um, interrelationship between compassion and capitalism? Um, I don't know if this is fully formed, okay. <laughs> but I'm thinking about, so I, I heard this from someone once and it made a lot of sense that capitalism, or at least the consumerism part of capitalism is uh, predicated on this feeling that we don't have enough. Like we are just constantly being told we don't have enough we and we are not enough and there isn't enough and uh and uh so i mean if i feel like that's uh, this is a part i'm not sure i can draw the line but uh for for me personally that's something i try to really notice like when i want something or i want to do something or i just you know i just pay attention to am i to, to, not do I need this, but is this coming from a feeling of there not being enough? And really there is, you know, and where and why and why do I feel like there's not enough when I do? But I'm thinking about how that's sort of antithetical to compassion. And it's something about kind of a zero sum game, you know, where like if I if somebody else has more then I have less. Right. And so uh, compassion really is about. Um, wanting everyone to have whatever it is that they need, right? Uh, and wanting everyone to, including happiness, which is not a material good, right? And that that's something that is possible, I believe, 
I believe it's possible, although I, I have a lot of anxiety about the number of human beings on this planet. And that gives me, it makes me skeptical. But that aside, I think it's possible that we can live in a, in a, in a way that we care for each other and that your happiness does not deplete mine. In fact, it actually enriches it. Mm. So those are some thoughts. May I ask? Yes. <laughs> and, and bring us to the relationship to compassion. Because I, I definitely hear what you're saying about the, the lack and scarcity mindset. And actually, that's going to be another a topic in the series. Mm-hmm. How is that creating or how does that interplay with this um, desire to alleviate suffering? I think that it it pushes us to you know, prioritize our needs over those of others um, in a way that's, you know, I mean, yeah, you got to put your oxygen mask on before you put it on your, you know, little neighbor, but it's, that's not a choice really beyond the basic, yeah, I need to take care of myself so that I can, you know, benefit others. But beyond that, there's not, there's no lack there's no lack of, there's no reason for me not to care for others. It Mm. does not detract from my caring. Mm. There's Mm. no limit on that. Yeah. 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 Resonates with me when you kind of started focusing on your needs, you know, Mm. and and like the oxygen mass example, it's like, Mm. you need the oxygen, right? We need food. We need Mm. basic shelter. We need clothes, basic needs, clothing, food, security but then yeah like this kind of overdoing it yeah and then the fear that if other people have more than i won't have enough all of that is kind of interwoven in creating this pushing down on yeah. oppressed groups yeah. yeah yeah thanks for being brave and sharing that uh-huh. thank you harry did you still want to share Sure. Um, As a practitioner of compassion, I've been practicing on the cushion for years and years. Um, I struggle with uh, balancing the immense uh, benefit that these practices have given me as, as an individual. But feeling inadequate that's maybe too strong a word or you know the the teachers talk about compassion as a drop uh, like a teardrop in the ocean right that that it's not nothing but it but it's something you know it's something very profound actually i struggle with how you know i i'm i'm in awe of your uh choices and i too have had similar choices, although maybe not renouncing all material wealth, that's, um, that's, that's bodhisattva in the world for sure. Um, what can we do in the world, do you think? What are the ways that showing up with a compassionate heart makes a difference? And, and how do we see that or recognize that? That's the question that seems to be very much a theme of my of my own sort of secular life Mm. yeah thanks barry and and this is i think a a question for for the whole group is how how is capitalism um inhibiting our ability to embody compassion how do we how do we do that when everything that we do in this system is creating problems for other people so something to reflect on if, if there's anything coming up for people that want to share around that. How, how do we not let capitalism interfere with our aspiration to embody compassion? It's really tough. I will just for, for a little disclaimer, I didn't get rid of everything. <laughs> I have 35 pieces of clothing, uh, but I, I just wanted to say that. 
Um, I do have needs. I have material needs. You know, I need to eat. I need shelter. I need clothing. But the key word is need. What do we need, you know, uh, in order to thrive? Um, but yeah, so with that out of the way, I think that this is a great question for everyone. You know, like how how are we meeting this challenge of embodying compassion in an economy that is directly opposed to it? How do we do that? I don't know is a great answer too. So, would you, you know, whatever's coming up, there's no right or wrong answers. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I can't see your names, but I can see that there's a hand up. Hi, hi, this is Angela. Um, what's coming up for me is, to the question, how in a capitalist society, in a capitalist economic system can we, um, prioritize compassion. Um, I, for me, I think the first step is even being aware of my habits and how they impact any everyone and any how they impact my me. If, if, mm. if I'm over consuming, how does that impact me? Does it mean I am caught up in a cycle that's not not even fruitful for me, never mind how it can be hurting uh, people and, and the planet. So um, I think for me, it's just cultivating that awareness of the impact I have, I can have, uh, just just being co constantly aware and constantly mindful of making um, choices to, so so I, I don't want to blindly consume, honestly, just, just uh, be aware and be careful. It's, I think what I practice. Hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Angela. I think there were there were, as you were sharing, I saw some thumbs up emojis and nods in the people nodding their heads in the room. As soon as you said the word awareness, it seemed to really resonate with the group. So my question for you is what comes after awareness? And I totally agree with you for the for you know, like that that is the first you have to turn and look. But then what? Yeah. Well, for me, it's already meant uh, making choices like giving up my car, uh, using public transit, biking, walking when I can, uh, reducing my carbon footprint, moving into a smaller space, uh, growing some food, uh, com um, connecting with my neighbors, <laughs> um, participating in community groups in my neighborhood. Um, yeah, and, and I'm also uh, thinking about uh, now that I may have some empty space in my room, thinking about how can I maybe open up a room to share with uh, maybe a university student that needs some space and some mentoring, um, maybe a First Nations person that could use some help from outside the city that's coming to school and just needs support. Yeah, just, just looking at so many possibilities. Hmm. How does it feel to share that with her? It's it's um, this this I, this recent idea I had of thinking about connecting with the university and seeing if I can help with 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 uh, helping a student is first time I've put it into words. Honestly, <laughs> it makes it feel a little more concrete. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. And and that's really, thank you for sharing that, Angela, really demonstrating kind of one of my intentions in creating the spaces so we can sound it out, you know, so we can talk about these things. And both Noam and Angela were like not, they're hearing it, they're, they're kind of talking through it. And that's what I, this space is, a brave space to kind of talk through these things and, and see how it sounds, try it on. So thank you for modeling that. Mm -hmm. um, I think for me, I've been just reflecting on how, in my experience, like cultivating the compassion first in whatever ways I can, most often 
will result in some kind of clarity in general about what to do or not do. Because if I don't start there and it becomes too intellectual, then I have definitely had my own kind of, uh, you know, self-improvement projects that have at the time felt like, you know, like, you know, uh, experimenting with giving up different things. And then like ended up somehow uh, like feeling along the way more selfish because of the amount of time and resources that it was taking for, just for me personally and like the way that it had, had affected my life. So it feels like, yeah, like um, I, I feel like when I met my most connected, that's when I can bring most balance to my life. And when it feels like I have the potential to affect others intuitively mm. in that way. And you, you mentioned um, when you, when you're the, when you're feeling connected. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about like what, what is, cause I, I, that really resonates with what you're sharing, you know, yeah. and to tell us a little bit more about what that means, what it means to feel connected. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it, um, I guess it, I guess it depends for me, you know, I have, uh, like, you know, like many others, I'm certainly not alone. I, I have a tendency to be very overly just like intellectual or cognitive or like ruminative. Right. Um, and so sometimes, you know, left to my own devices that like I'll spend more time alone or thinking or trying to like, just solve a problem. Right. For, for whatever way. Um, but but feeling more connected, you know, um, often it comes from like making some concerted effort to spend time with others as I go drag myself out of the apartment tonight. Um, to, do, to do that and to, and to, to make a time and space for, for relationships to form um, and really unfold, no matter who it is right and like attending to wh whoever i can um i'm you know i do claim i don't claim to be good at it at all but just really like even in um even with like acquaintances throughout the day like people that you might see like on your block or uh, it doesn't always have to be like the most intense connection with like a deep friend or or a big group um so I'm looking for just ways to, yeah, just like to, to, to not be going through the motions, right. Mm -hmm. And to have that feeling of uh, human connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, just to reflect back, I, I heard the first things that you said was your practice. And I think that's really key, you know, that all of this all starts, it's an inside job first. We're talking about like big external factors, but what I really appreciate about what you shared is that it starts with your practice. And then as you continue talking and responded to my question about feeling connection, you then went to people that are around you. And this is exactly how this works. It all has systematic change starts with the individual. So I really do appreciate that you're kind of, um naming that that it starts from your own practice and then in your more immediate circles and then it just keeps rippling out with that so i also really appreciate that i can't remember your exact words but like it's not perfect or not getting it right all the time like yeah it's all experimentation you know so thanks for being real with that and then um matthew are you Ready for sharing? Yeah, I, um, I like to do things that have direct impact on people I encounter with, um, for example, I, 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 the, the person who pays my house, I pay quite handsome and I tip really big. And to me, these are ways of 
tiny little ways of trying to reduce, you know, <laughs> a, a little bit income inequality. And, and I feel a direct connection with that person and it feels good in my body. And it, I just feel like doing this kind of, these kind of acts consistently and generously make a little difference in somebody's life. Anyway, that's my comment. Yeah, thank you, Matthew. And, and maybe in big ways, you know, a big tip for one person might be a big difference in, in their, in their life. So yeah. And I appreciate, uh, that you're naming generosity. Generosity in yeah. and of itself is an yeah. ethic. Yeah. It's, it's adjacent to compassion, but it is its own. So yeah, I really appreciate, I appreciate that. And I give money to people on the street and I don't question whether they're going to use it for I was mm -hmm. just myself for 10 years. <laughs> so maybe they need it for booze. I don't, that, it's not, it's not my concern. Mm -hmm. They need it to survive. Mm -hmm. so I don't discriminate. I can't. It is impossible living in this city to give to everyone because there are you out for a walk. You know, they're just, it's, it's, in, it's dozens and dozens and dozens, but, um, I frequently do give quite generously to somebody. Uh -huh. And then I feel like, okay, I don't feel bad that it, that's it. It's like the next person, it's like, I feel, I feel, I feel good about my action and I don't feel guilty when I feel like I've, uh, you know, given what to me feels the right amount on a particular day. The other thing I appreciate about what you're sharing is that you use the word multiple times in that feel. Yeah. I feel, you know, and we, that's why in that opening practice, yes, it was interoception. Yes. It was being with the body, but we're strengthening our ability to feel and kind of using the felt experience as almost like our internal GPS. Um, so just naming how it feels for you to give that tip or to be generous <clears throat> is a perfect example of that. Thank you for sharing and, that. And I, I will say conversely, there have been times when I have been, I remember a period after a breakup when I was so profoundly lost in anguish that I could walk by, you know, a begging mother with her baby on the street and barely give a shit. <laughs> I was just so shut down. <laughs> there was no, there was no open heartedness. It was gone. So, you know, comes and goes. Mm. It comes and goes. And very similar to what we were hearing before, it starts with the practice. That's right. Right. So I, yeah, I really, I mean, I think I'll say for me, it feels so huge, these problems. And then like very similar to what we're hearing with other people, it's like, okay, if I practice compassion for me, maybe three or four times a week, I'll do a dedicated compassion practice that's the starting ground. Like that's, if there was a, a line in the, in the poem kind of like start where you are, you know? Yeah. And so that's like, for me, and it sounds like for other people, it's like, wow, this is so big, but it starts with the awareness and the practice. Yeah. Well, then it happens spontaneously. Best way. There's no yeah. thinking. Right. There's no thinking. It's just right action. It just becomes right, right action. That's all. And yeah. Thank you. Yeah. For me, when we were doing the meditation and you talked about um, becoming aware of the other people in the room and that we're all suffering, for me, it was a, 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 a tremendous sense of relief mm. and a reminder. And it's it's very interesting for me because because of just the the cultures that I come from and my background, I was raised with this very 
heavy feeling of burden, like, you know, um, in terms of it's my job to make the world better. You know, there's a lot of people out there. And so just this feeling of in some ways having the world on my shoulders. And then at the same time, like especially well and but let's just say for example in in work environments it's really been a journey for me to understand myself as a part of a larger whole instead of like me against everyone or me just sort of fighting for what i need um so it's kind of, it's that's just something i've been reflecting on just that paradox of those two things uh, and for me, what in terms of what does seem to work is a couple of things. The first is when I'm really clear on what my purpose is in a situation, especially if it's coming from like a place of like love or generosity or excitement to contribute something to the whole. Those are the times where I feel like it's I can most access the ability to to be compassionate because it's not necessarily coming from a place of like guilt or burden but as a from a place of contributing or someone mentioned generosity earlier i'm not exactly sure what that has to do with compassion but that's just what feels right to me and then the other part too is also being aware of what i don't have to offer for example, recently I had a phone conversation with a family member because I felt like I needed to call them. I felt sort of guilty. And at the same time, like I really didn't want to be talking to them. And so I think that that kind of came through, you know, in some ways. And so also just thinking about like, how can I show up in ways that are not necessarily that are um, that are generous that aren't coming from a place of of guilt. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. I think the first part of what you shared really speaks to the interdependent interdependence of all things being a part of a whole. You know, so that's why it's so important to practice those meditations and the worldview of interconnection, exactly as you were describing that. And then it's it's ironic because the, the part about the family member and the and and your feelings around that, it's very similar to kind of what Noam was saying is like we got to put our oxygen mask on, you know. So before we kind of tackle whether they're interpersonal or huge structural things, we need to make sure that we're grounded and then that, and we're taking care of our basic needs first before we can support other people. So I really appreciate you sharing that. What gets in the way? What makes it so hard to kind of find this overlap or this this compatibility of compassion with capitalism? Why is it so why is it so hard? Sarana. Okay. Um I think in my uh, spiritual journey, I have experienced like this conflict and relation resolution, this kind of journey with, with like my spiritual growth and also like, um, like surviving and having a balance to having a good life. Like um, they've been and like many years ago, I used to run uh, a business, although I had a lot of good intentions in my business, but the day to day, my life required me to think about money all day. And, and then, so, so then I felt like, okay, so I want to live a spiritual life and I want to make it my priority, but all day I'm thinking about money. <laughs> so like, how's that aligned? So I kind of, um, so like then that like back and forth lots of journeys and then uh uh and then the the last six years i guess um and majority of it i i was surviving on like very little money and then 
that kind of that adds a lot of stress and struggle in life and that that helps me to show up my best and to be um like better person to to have like you know that limits me and and I can't show up for other people either when I'm myself so and I had to be strong and I had to start making more money and I had to succeed and I had to focus on those things again so um so I think um what really helped me is um uh, that uh, the Hinduist teaching like Bhagavad Gita, it's like showing up. Um, so I started like, okay, this is, uh, I am my own first responsibility. So I need to take care of myself. And uh, also like me taking care of myself well, could also inspire someone else to do well. And then um, um, the way I do it is like, um, not to focus too much on the fruit of the labor, but just to give myself to the work. Like, oh. just just like, like for example, like when I go to work in the morning, um, like I remind myself, okay, today, like I cannot just like, like, because it's my such a like habitual ego, like it wants recognition. It wants like, like, you know, gets my rate high or like whatever, like a lot of like attachment to fruits so I just like like um, remind myself to be aware of those things and not to focus on the outcome and then just to like be present and it's very hard to like everything is so interconnected so it's very hard not to harm anything I do see it like at work you know like I am doing this work but then my company is creating a whole lot of junk there (laughs) like you know but or just like this is like my role is this designer like like I'm gonna do my part I'm gonna show up and then just uh you know just do my work <laughs> just give mm. myself for the work yeah mm. thank you for sharing I love that you started talking about intention. And I think that's that's a really important thing here, you know, is that we can, I think that from my perspective, just having an intention to go out in the world and not cause harm and try to alleviate other people's suffering, that's that's a great starting point. You know, so when you said the word intention and kind of some bells went off for me, I think you, you talked a lot about money particularly. And I think something to consider, this isn't really a teaching, but just something to think about the difference between money and capitalism mm. and money in, in, in inherently is not the problem, right? We do need some way of exchange, but we don't necessarily need it to be in the form that it is in our economy. So I appreciate you sharing your journey with that. Um, and then as a designer, it's just interesting. I was sharing, uh, So I teach at Pratt Institute, which is a design school. And we had a conversation today on how as designers, they have the responsibility to make sure that the product that they're designing is ethically sourced. Uh, They know the, the carbon footprint of it. Like there's a lot of power in the design world to make change. Uh, towards ethical direction within capitalism. So really appreciate that you are, you're there doing that work. Um, The other thing that kind of came to mind is that there is no, um, I'm not insinuating that we should all quit our jobs and stop, full stop participating in capitalism, right? But it's like, how can we start influencing change from within? And we are looking at each other, whether we want to admit that or not, we are scanning and observing what other people are doing. And so when one person shows up in work and says, I've done this, I've I've been contemplating how can we do this in a way that's ethical, you know, like people are going to hear that that's creating a model. And that's really what this, this whole exploration about embodiment of these ethics is. And I just think that because you, you went, you said that word designer, you know, like there's so much power in that role to influence change. So thank you for, for sharing Uh, I see another hand up. Yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to address was why why it's so hard. I work mm-hmm. at 
which is kind of amazing. They actually have human first as their very first um, vision for the company with high productivity behind that. And they did amazing things around COVID and getting people transportation between states if they needed it for abortion access or trans care. And at the end of the day, what matters is that the people on the board get their return. And right. those people are not contributing to the company. So whatever great goals, in the end, it's still about the capitalist part, um, the consumerist part. And I wanted to, and the, and the other thing was we talked about, you know, we start with ourselves and my experience as a person and as an activist was very much one-on-one -on -one is where the only place I've ever seen minds change very much. But then we, we make groups, right? We get like-minded and we try and create change. And guess what? That theoretically becomes democracy. And that is supposed to be how we balance consumerism. And then you look at the state of our politics, and I want to lay on the floor and beat my hands and cut people's throats and all that good stuff. Um, mm. But I think ideally, right, you start from the beginning, you make groups, you come together, you're working for the greater good on the human side. I think that's supposed to be the balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think that's important, your point about, you know, these companies or leaders that say that we're human first. No, if you're participating in a capitalist economy, you are profit first, because the minute that your people initiatives are not profitable or they're affecting your bottom line, it'll be dropped. Right. And so where's the accountability? And this is where I even just saying that my heart started beating a little bit faster. It's like we need to start holding people accountable to that. Like if you're saying that this is people first, I, I can't remember, maybe it's REI. They have signs all over their sign, their store that say people over profit. And it's like, okay, then do you not have sales goals? Like, are you, you know, like it's a beautiful aspiration and I wish for it to be true, but is it, you know? So yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, and we are at time. You wanna? I was just thinking about how corporations and entities so we're yes. culture with things that are not human and that are right. moral. Yeah. Yeah. And we share our space with them. Yes. And we vote and they own politics, politicians mm -hmm. and they run our lives. Yeah. So. Yep. Can people online hear that? Okay, good, because it was really well articulated. Thank you for that. Yeah, corporations are entities. And what we've been talking about and talking and practicing about is our humanness. And so even just the, the structure in and of itself goes against compassion and the human aspect of this. Okay, so I do feel like these probably should be two hour classes. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing. Uh, it was really inspirational for me to hear kind of what's on your mind and hearts with this topic. It's big, you know, like it's not something that seems like it's not something that we can that at the end of an hour and a half class that we're going to have resolution to. But that's why we're having these conversations. We can't just turn away from it. You know, we heard the words awareness a lot, the feeling that we have to be with what's happening. We can't just turn a side eye to it, especially those of us that are in San Francisco where we see it all the time. And I noticed for me, even like, I kind of, I'm like, is that any other city that I would be in that I would walk down the street and someone was laying there? I'd be like, oh my God, there's someone died. Someone, does this person need help? But for some reason in San Francisco, it's just normal. Like we've almost become numb to it. Sorry, I kind of went off on a tangent there. <laughs> The point being that a lot of these core fundamental principles that we've been sharing about our practice, that it starts with us, our intention, um, our oxygen mask, our needs versus our wants, money versus capitalism. These are all really important. And I like you to consider them to be seeds, right? So these conversations are planting seeds of awareness um, together as a community, we can brainstorm and talk about why it's so hard and um, hold leaders accountable and vote in ways that will affect change. Um, 
And most of all, the whole point of this class is to embody the change. So while it might feel impossible to go against this huge system or these big corporate entities uh, or ingrained social norms, it's about having the courage. It's about having the bravery to step outside of that and try and experiment or talk, have conversations. And at a minimum, just practice. You know, that's that's one of the things that on on, on days where I'm like, I can't. I can't, I don't have the energy. It's, it's, it's crossing my boundary to, to try and fight this. I can still practice compassion. So there was a, there was a, a passage that I read last week. Um, and I, I really like the sentence. We're not going to dismantle our capitalist systems, but can we safeguard mental health in the midst of this? And I think that's a really important point. How do we safeguard our compassion while we participate in a world that is lacking it? We practice. So I want to finish um, our time together tonight the same way that we started. And so I read this poem of creating a brave space in the context of our togetherness. And now I want you to hear these words about a brave space of what it's like to carry this out there. So instead of just about the brave space together here, how do we create our world outside of the Dharma Center to be a brave space? Together, we'll create a brave space because there's no such thing as a safe space. We exist in the real world. We all carry scars and have all caused wounds. In this space, we seek to turn down the volume of the outside world. We amplify voices that fight to be heard elsewhere. We call each other to more truth and love. We have the right to start somewhere and continue to grow. We have the responsibility to examine what we think we know. We will not be perfect. It will not always be what we wish it to be, but it will be our brave space together and we will work on it side by side. So may we move forward from this night, creating brave space together out there in the world. Thank you all for showing up, for listening, for practicing, for sharing. Um, we'll be continuing this series through May. We're going to continue exploring different secular ethics. Um, as I mentioned at the start of the class, we are a Donna donation run organization. So these teachings and practices are offered freely um, and any um, generosity that you would like to express to keep our center thriving and our teachers compensated is greatly appreciated, even if that's just a wish for well-being in your heart, that's more than enough.